coming up on News 2. The senator has pled not guilty. He's denied the charges against him, and he's looking forward to his day in court when he can show the public that he is innocent. Senator Alvin Williams and his chief of staff, Kim Blackett, pled not guilty to several charges. The paper ballot counting is still ongoing. Voters are asking, what's taking so long? Plus, some fifth and sixth graders spent the day in college. Find out what the lessons of the day were. Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Romancing. Top in this newscast, breaking news came out of district court on Wednesday when both Senator Alvin Williams and his chief of staff, Kim Blackett, pled not guilty to several charges that include bribery, mail fraud, and wire fraud. Additionally, the third indicted defendant, Gary Sproul, turned himself into authorities who arrested him right before his appearance in court. News 2's Alison bourne was at district court and has the story. Senator Alvin Williams and his legal team arrived to district court at about 9.15 for arraignment proceedings on Wednesday. Williams, along with his chief of staff, Kim Blackhead, and staff member Gary Sprow, all faced several charges that include bribery, mail fraud, and wire fraud. While Williams and Blackhead were indicted on November 8th, Sprow turned himself into authorities right before court proceedings on Wednesday and was arrested right before his initial court appearance. Judge Ruth Miller began arraignment proceedings with Blackhead, who pled not guilty to her charges. After Blackhead, Senator Alvin Williams also pled not guilty to all of his charges. Judge Miller gave both Blackhead and Senator Williams until November 21st to submit discovery documents and evidence, and December 3rd to file any motions. Judge Miller set a pretrial conference date for December 12th, a motions hearing date for January 2nd, and a trial date for January 7th. The senator's been charged with some serious offenses, but you've only had a chance to hear one side of the story, and that's what the government has to say. I can assure you there's another side. The senator has pled not guilty. He's denied the charges against him, and he's looking forward to his day in court when he can show the public that he is innocent, that he's a scapegoat uh, for others, uh, but that he himself is innocent of the charges that have been brought against him. So we're looking forward to that day. We're looking forward to the trial so uh, we can bring out the truth of what, what lies behind all of this. And also in court that day will be the fourth defendant. The government officially named the fourth defendant as Ace Development Inc., which is the construction company that Senator Williams has an interest in. At District Court, I'm Allison bourne Vanek for News 2. Now it was also announced that Chief District Court Judge Curtis Gomez has been assigned to the trial that's so far set for January 7th. Paper ballot counting is still ongoing in both districts, make, making it eight days since the election, and voters can't seem to understand what's taken election officials so long to count just 1,500 ballots in the St. Thomas-St. John district. And because ballots have been separated by race, stray ballots for other races are being found in the wrong piles. News 2's Erica Bivens has the tales. We are left you know, like, like orphans, help yourselves. And I believe we should help ourselves by mandating that a new election be called. Many candidates and concerned voters are now rallying together, calling for a new election, suggesting a one-page paper ballot be used for everyone. Why? We have violated practically every law that we should have been following. One of the most recent causes for concern stems from the fact that election officials separated paper ballots by races, which prevents candidates from being able to track where their votes came from. And now election officials are finding stray ballots mixed in from races they already counted. We found several strays. They were to be packed and placed in a bin uh, along with the counted ballots. And I had a little objection to them putting seals on that bin as well. We should have gone through each box individually, counted those boxes, then I would have known what votes I got at one place and at one school or one precinct, I would have known, everybody would have known how this stood if we had gone in accordance with the law. Stray ballots were not included in yesterday's count of 617 paper ballots for the Board of Elections race, which continued this afternoon, but it's still not over. We still have strays to be counted. We have provisional ballots that 
has to be counted and the absentee mail-in. Election officials say some 300 absentee ballots remain at large and another 20 provisional ballots must be counted as well. For News 2, I'm Erica Bivens. Election officials resumed counting the remaining ballots for the Board of Elections race at 5 o'clock on Wednesday. Again, absentee ballots must be in and counted by Friday and results certified by November 21st, according to their consent decree. Meanwhile, election officials in St. Croix finished counting the ballots for the Board of Elections race. The unofficial results show Liliana Bellardo de O'Neill maintains the number one seat, followed by Lisa Harris-Moorhead, Roland Molinar, and Glenn Webster, rounding out the top four seats. If aid Joseph follows, follows in fifth place, and Krista Schluterman remains number six. St. Croix election officials reconvened Wednesday to count the remaining paper ballots for the Board of Education race and will move to the delegate to Congress and hemp referendum once that is completed. Police say an assault occurred in Emancipation Garden on St. Thomas on November 10th. A 70-year-old man told police he was feeding some birds in the park when two men approached him and asked for money. The victim told them he did not have any money and one suspect hit him in the head with a handgun and the other suspect kicked, kicked him in the stomach. The victim was taken to the Schneider Regional Medical Center and was treated for bruises and conditions to his face and body. The Criminal Investigation Bureau investigates. The Criminal Investigation Bureau detectives are also investigating on St. Thomas the non-fatal shooting of a 24-year-old man. The shooting occurred in Limburg Bay on November 11th. According to the initial report, the victim told police he was approached by a man in a gray hooded jacket who told him, don't move, and fired two to three shots in his direction. The victim was struck in the upper part of his left leg. He was treated at the Schneider Regional Medical Center. Detectives continue to investigate this case. Well, police believe a perpetrator may have cut his hair during a third-degree burglary that occurred at the Megan's Bay concession on November 11th. According to the initial police report, an undetermined amount of cash was taken during the robbery. Representatives of the Megan's Bay concession also told police that the suspect apparently cut his hair while inside the building and left several locks strewn about. Security equipment was also destroyed. Police are urging the public to report what they know regarding this crime. VI residents who regularly shop at Walmart might be interested to know that some items will no longer be available for shipment to the territory. Congresswoman Donna Christensen has been investigating recent complaints from the committee about Walmart's recent restrictions and has gotten a response from the corporate giant. News 2's Erica Parsons has more. Local prices for grocery and other items have been driving residents to shop online more and more, and one of the companies benefiting from those sales has been Walmart. But in October, it seemed as if the company suddenly changed their shipping policy to the territory, and Delegate to Congress Donna Christensen's office was flooded with complaints from residents. Similarly, frustrations were voiced online locally, like this one. My last two orders from Walmart's home section were no longer able to ship to our area. These are the same things I've been ordering for months. And this one that alleges the VI government is behind the restriction. I just heard from a furniture delivery man that one of the senators is trying to stop Walmart from shipping here, so we are forced to buy locally. One mom says, though, if we don't support the economy, there would be no VI. Unfortunately, I don't think there should be any shipping restrictions put on the VI, but I also think that we should try to buy local as much as possible. And so I am removed from the Walmart.com controversy because we've never ordered anything from Walmart, and we do try to buy everything locally. Um, but I do think that the, the Virgin Islands should be treated as Puerto Rico, for example, and Puerto Rico has much less shipping costs than the Virgin Islands. Christensen contacted Walmart earlier this month and was initially told their policy of shipping products to the VI had not changed. Now in response to the delegates' inquiry about what items are restricted and why the sudden policy change, Walmart says, We've made some recent shipping changes that may impact you. Based on carrier limitations and other factors, we're unable to ship consumables to the VI and other protectorates. For customers in the VI, we offer shipping on the majority of general merchandise items carried online, as well as free shipping on select holiday purchases of $45 or more. Unfortunately, consumables including health and beauty products, household cleaning supplies, and dry grocery items are no longer available to ship to the VI. Delia Christensen said Tuesday that her office will continue to investigate how and where the shipping restrictions originated, and once they know something, they'll let the community know. Reporting from St. Croix, I'm Erica Parsons for News 2.
And according to Walmart, the shipping changes also affect Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other offshore U.S. territories. Turning our attention stateside, President Obama had hoped to be laying out goals for his second term at his first news conference since his re-election. Instead, he's answering questions about the growing scandal that took down the head of the CIA and is now threatening the future of a top general. Daniel Nottingham reports on the White House. At his first press conference,